Hallelujah. Oh, you're about to get me drunk in the spirit now. <laughs> Glory. Thank you, Lord. But go ahead. You, you, you go ahead. You can. Y'all can have a seat. You can go ahead and turn these monitors on up here and give me. I've had so much. I've fallen so in love with you. I just blew out my voice every second. <laughs> I'll return tomorrow, but I left my voice in Phoenix <laughs> in Peoria. <laughs> oh, I, I just want to say something real quick to the worship team, to this family. Uh, you know, you love everybody in the kingdom, but you don't take pleasure in everybody the same in the kingdom. And God loves us all. But he takes pleasure in, in ones. And we know that because John told that about himself, that he was the beloved disciple. That's right. He said, I'm the one the Lord loves. He even records in, the, in his gospel how he beat Peter racing to the tomb. And he said, the beloved disciple beat Peter to the tomb. <laughs> And, I, and as I was sitting here tonight, I was just thinking, what? Because I want to honor you, and that's easy to do, but I want to honor you with, I was said, Lord, who do you think of Fresh Start as when you look upon them? And I heard him clearly say, they're my beloved disciple. They're my beloved disciple. And here's what I mean by that. And, and I'm speaking this about the worship team because you carry that heart. And here's what I mean. John was a son of thunder. He could rumble with the best of them. He's the one that wanted to call down fire and kill everybody in a Samaritan village and then walk over their dead charred bones so that he wouldn't have to walk a quarter of a mile around the village. This was a serious guy of faith. Now you might look at him and go, he had the spirit of murder, but the guy at least thought he could do it. Imagine that. I can do it, Jesus. Hey, Jesus, do you want me to call down? Whoa, that about got me. <laughs> and he actually thought he could do it. He was a son of thunder. He preached with power. In other words, he had a gift on his voice. Everybody in this house has a gift on their voice. I've never had a church out pray me in the spirit. I'm being dead serious about that. We have been everywhere, and you guys, when we said, come on, expand your capacity, y'all called us and then raised us 30 minutes. <laughs> I have never, I, I want to say this, when we say this, we, we never hype and we never flatter. That doesn't accomplish anything. But I've never been in a place that has more power on voices than this house. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm looking at 10 year old kids down here with lungs. Love. The elderly standing by me, out shouting me. I've never seen a multi generational anointing on a voice like thunder. In fact, the very first time I walked in this house, I, I, see, a, I see a vision only a few times. 
and it's Thor's hammer. It's the Psalm 29 anointing. And you reach back and I saw a whole church grab that hammer and it's the God of thunder. The God of glory thunders over the waters. He shakes the desert. And the anointing on the voice in this house. It's unbelievable. The anointing on the voices. It's the most beautiful thing, one of the most beautiful things I've seen. Amen. The anointing for preaching and singing and articulation. You are, it, it almost feels like the whole house has that anointing for preaching and singing in a very unusual way and for praying. And you can see it on you. And I just want to recognize that and say this is the hand of the Lord. Amen. It's very beautiful. Amen. And so... So I actually believe this place will raise up many powerful preachers and worship leaders and intercessors out of this womb will come forth. That's one thing. The other thing is that John is the one who leaned his breast back on Jesus and he loved that intimacy with him. Now here's the interesting thing is John failed many times like Peter, but at the Last Supper, Peter would not even ask Jesus a question. And the gospel tells us that when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, Peter didn't dare ask Jesus. He said, get John to ask him. They had equally blown it up to that point. And yet there was something in John that trusted that Jesus could receive him even in his weakness and failures. So that on the night of the Lord's Supper, even after a spirit, John had had a spirit of murder and a spirit of ambition that wanted to rule over the whole human race at the right hand of Jesus for all eternity. You don't get much, much bigger than a spirit of ambition than to ask, get your mama to ask Jesus to rule over the whole human race at the right hand of Messiah forever. And then Jesus said, are you willing to be baptized with my baptism? And he said, yes. So he doesn't just have a spirit of ambition, it's pride. You mean you can die as the sinless, spotless lamb for the sins of the world. Oh, I can do it. (laughs) And yet he had a relationship with Jesus that even in the midst of his issues, he could lean back and said, I know you love me. My love may be weak, but it's real. I know you love me. And then the third thing is he was attentive to the Lord. Attentive. He was attentive. You only entrust your mama to somebody who's attentive. He leaned back on Jesus' breast. He asked him questions. Who is it going to betray you? Jesus tells him. And then he entrusts his mama to him, which is family, the fourth thing. I just kept hearing the the anointing on the voice, the worshiping, preaching warrior. John was a warrior. Man, you mess with him, you're getting James and John's coming at you, man. Sons of thunder are on you. And yet, he has this special place of belovedness. He knows he's loved even in his weakness. And he's attentive. I've watched. I've been blown away. He says, have you heard the song, This Is How I Fight My Battle, and you sing it the next one. You have actually let me and Corey tell you what songs to sing. (laughs) No, 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 there is no worship team in the earth. (laughs) They they let us do it because they humor us for two days, but it gets on their nerves. That's right. But I've watched how you've interacted. With, with your pastors and leaders and you're attentive. They say one thing, you're boom, you're on it. That kind of honor and attentiveness. I, I don't know if you know this, but I want to tell you because we go in places with world-renowned worship leaders, you have as good a worship team as anywhere on the earth. That's right. Yes. 
and they carry that same spirit as the beloved disciple. Oh, I pray you write so many songs. Amen. I pray you write so many songs. Amen. We need the spirit that you carry on the songs that That's you right. sing. That's right. Come on, I'm, I'm wearing this t-shirt. That's right. Your song, I'm wearing it. I want a lot more t-shirts with a lot more songs. I've wore that shirt all year long that we won't settle. One of my favorite shirts. I, I, I've fallen in love. I could, I could worship with you all day, every day. Amen. And I tell you what, here's the other thing. The way you have such freedom and playfulness with warring, that has a pure spirit on the stage. Right. It's not hype, it's not performance, it's not religion. How do you mingle this playfulness before God and this warring in the spirit before God and purity at the same time? Yeah. It's unbelievable. That's right. And to see the multicultural beauty that's on this stage, man, come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. And then one last thing, and then I'm done, but I, it needs to be said, because Corey's been bragging about you for a whole year. I, I'm not kidding. For a whole year, he's been going, you have to meet my family in Peoria. You have to meet my family at Fresh Start, for real. And, and, and uh, Corey's one anointed, brilliant guy, and you need to take what he says serious. Your pastor set the tone. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Honor them. Honor them. They set the tone. I love it. Hallelujah. Well, okay, we'll get into the Word now. But you need to feel the enjoyment that you are so enjoyed by God. Yes. It's such a delight. Yes. We just love you. You're in our hearts. We're going to carry you. We're going to really carry you. That you would walk in all that He has for you. But you are so beloved. Don't know what that is, but hallelujah. <laughs> well, we're going to jump right in. We, we have a word. We're going to do something that we rarely do, but we think you can hear it. And um, uh, as I preface it, as we get into it, we've done this a handful of times. And usually on this first one we do, a spirit of encounter comes into the room. So we want to we want to go there, but before I do that, I, I want to. What I love about this church is that you're not just seeking revival. You're not just claiming your revival. You want to sustain revival. Yes, yes. And you know you see that with Jesus in Matthew chapter four. At the very end of Matthew chapter four, it says they're bringing all the demonized, the sick, and all with various. Uh, illnesses says he healed them all and as he's healing them casting out devils healing the sick suddenly in the midst of full-blown revival in Galilee he stops and it says he sits down and Matthew 5 6 and 7 he gives the Sermon on the Mount now most of us don't think of the Sermon on the Mount as a revival sermon but it was the sermon that's recorded in Luke 6. It's most likely the sermon that he gave on a regular basis throughout all the towns. So that as revival's going on, Jesus stops and teaches on character. Because here's the issue. Times of revival is when God breaks in and gives you that unusual ability to change. 
Most people only preach on revival during revival. Jesus wants to teach you on how to sustain revival in revival. On how to carry revival. On how to be a birther of revival in you. And so Jesus would teach on principles that would cultivate the inner life and the actions of love that would continue the move of the spirit among the people of God. And so when revival comes, you need to leverage that opportunity when the spirit is here to do the miracle, which is to soften a human heart. Because most churches, when you speak the truth, there's too much hardness to receive the word. There's too much hardness and division and bitter envy going on to receive the word. So you're always fighting against the hardness of human hearts. But revival comes and breaks in and makes what we wish to be true, true. It's an unusual window to change. So when revival's here, leverage it with all your might to change in the power of the Holy Spirit. That you would be a carrier of revival all your days because God, you've made your own inner man, that garden where God comes and walks in the cool of the day. You're the dwelling place. And so tonight we wanna speak on something that we believe is crucial to sustaining the fire of the Holy Spirit for revival. So open with me your Bibles to Proverbs 17, 17. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Now turn with me to Ecclesiastes, just turn one book over. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine. Two are better than one. Let me say that again. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone. Let me say that again. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. For he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now turn back with me to Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. And I'm gonna skip to the last verse. For there the Lord commands the blessing. How would you like to have the Lord command a blessing over your life? Even life forevermore, it says. That when brethren dwell together in unity, the psalmist says, there is a pleasant place, a good place. But he ends it with, hey, it's more than just good and pleasant in your life and relationships. It's that place God commands the blessing. There's a verse in the Bible says that whatever Joseph set his hands to, the Lord blessed. Do you know what happens with the blessing of the Lord? Joseph could have a bad idea and God would still bless it. Whatever he set his hands to, Joseph blessed, God blessed. 
Imagine that. The Lord looks and says, when I find brothers or sisters dwelling together in unity, I command a blessing that whatever they would do would prosper. Oh, if, I, if you had to choose between gifting and the commanded blessing, which would you choose? The commanded blessing. So we want to talk to you tonight of what we call the fellowship of the burning heart. Spiritual friendship. We want to speak to you tonight. This man right here, I'd die for him. In a heartbeat and be glad to take the bullet. He would do the same for me. This is a friendship born in a place of the spirit of revelation. We'll get to that in a minute. But I want to say this. Right now, there's the beautiful revelation going through the body of Christ, and it's the revelation of our sonship. How many are glad to be a son or daughter of God? <laughs> to have the family seal the Holy Spirit. <laughs> to have the family resource called angels. <laughs> to have the family inheritance. The family name. Oh, beloved, you have family access. You can close your eyes and you're in the presence of your heavenly father. You can't get a meeting today with the mayor of Phoenix, but today, right now, with the potentate of the whole universe, you have access. I was at a conference one time and, the, and my son couldn't get back to the green room back behind there. And he called me, he said, Dad, they, they won't let me back to the green room. And I, I called the head of the, the pastor. I said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to leave. He said, why? I said, because my son can't get access to me. So you have to make a decision. Either my son gets access wherever I go, or I have to leave. I love you, but I have to leave. Because my son always has access. You have access today. Wherever you go, you have access. How many are glad to be a son or a daughter? And we're not only, we're not only getting the revelation of our sonship, our daughtership, our belovedness in the Lord, we're also getting the revelation of the importance of fathers and moms and daughters and sons. It's one of the most beautiful revelations God is giving. But I want to talk to you tonight about another revelation because before you can be a good father, you know you have to be a good son, but there's a transition as well. You have to be a good brother before you can be a good father. And I want to let you know that there's a commanded blessing there. For blessed is the man who has many sons. Why? He will contend with the enemy in the gate. There's an anointing when brothers and sisters come together in unity that's not the same as fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. Hear me. If you're a son or a daughter, you will take a lot from your parents. If you're a parent, you will take doubly amount from your kids. But if your sibling crosses you, you don't take nothing from your brother or sister. In fact, as a father, I spend most of my time reminding my sons about one another. Samuel comes to me and says, Joshua, oh my gosh. I go, no, Joshua's my boy. <laughs> He's your brother. Jonathan comes and says, Samuel's jacked up. No, Samuel's my boy. He's your brother. I spend 95% of my time trying to help them discover one another. Because what they perceive as the rub issue is actually their gift. Your brother or sister, the very thing that rubs you is your gift. They're your gift. So I go, Samuel, Joshua's your gift. It grates your nerves because he's your gift. <laughs> you want him to be your gifting, but he's actually God's gift in his gifting to you. 
And if you ever discover that and humble yourself to the gift, you'll get the commanded blessing. Now, the reason why I say this is, is because when we actually look in the Bible, the assault doesn't always come between, or I'll say it this way, mostly doesn't come between the fathers and mothers and the daughters and sons. The very first assault will not come between Adam and Abel. It comes between the brothers, Cain and Abel. The next assault won't come between Isaac and Abraham. It'll come between Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Moses and his brethren. David's brothers didn't believe in him. It's always the brothers. That's why as soon as Jesus says, Peter gives the pronouncement, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. The identity of Jesus is known to become the rallying point of unity among the brothers. And the very next thing, a great dispute arose among the disciples over who's the greatest. It's always the brothers. It's always the brothers. The same is true, though, where you see the brothers come together. When Moses and Aaron can humble the strongest empire of the day. Joshua and Caleb can take an entire promised land. David and his mighty men can bring forth the kingdom. And when Jesus searches for a leadership team, I'm just offering scripture to you. Don't get mad at me at what I'm going to say. He doesn't pick a multi-generational leadership team. Don't get mad at me. That's God. He chooses brothers. Can you imagine when Jesus chose James and John, Peter and Andrew, and then in the midst of that, he chose Peter, James, and John and left out Andrew from the inner circle? Do you know who's going to have the biggest reward in the next age? I believe Andrew. He had to overcome the jealousy. He had to be the humble brother to serve. Jesus chose brothers. There was a reason why he sent them out two by two. There's strength in brothers and ladies. When I say brothers, I mean sisters too. There's a strength there. And we found one of the greatest blessings of our lives outside of the Bible, the Word, the church, our children, has been this friendship that God has given us. And how we came together in the place of prayer to find one of the greatest strengths and blessings of our lives. I just want to, I, I just want to say you, we both came on staff in Kansas City. I mean, he had been there before leading in the school and part of the church that Mike was formerly pastoring. We officially came on at the same time at, at the House of Prayer in December of 2000. And this is a phrase I said yesterday or I said on Friday night, you need to find someone who will sing your song back to you when you forget it and stick closely to that person. What we began to connect around, I want you to go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 24. Because we want to give you a vision, not just for just finding any brother or finding any sister and looking for someone to hang out with, because it almost feels anticlimactic. We talk about revivals coming, hosting revival, stewarding revival, and one of the wineskins to walk out revival is brothers and sisters together, and it almost feels anticlimactic. What? what? What does that mean? That means that God has designed it in such a way in one of his most powerful, I mean, revival history is filled with brothers, John and Charles Wesley. The whole earth has been changed because of a couple of brothers. Revival history is filled with brothers. I love how Jesus shows up to his brother after the resurrection. 
James. That's right. And I love how you say that. Well, you know what? It, it, there's a sense of Jesus would not move on without his brother. Can you imagine being the little brother of Jesus? <laughs> how many times did Mary say, why can't you be more like your brother? <laughs> He's the sinless, spotless lamb. Imagine growing up in his shadow, so much so that we know James in the gospel is absolutely did not believe Jesus. And one gospel says he thought he was mad. In fact, he thought he was mad and said, Jesus, why don't you go to Jerusalem and show them who you are if you are that? And Jesus says back, because I can't go. I can't just go to Jerusalem any old time, James. You can go anytime you want because you're not anointed. <laughs> you will not stir up anything. Ain't nobody going to notice But you. I'm anointed. And if I go, I've got to make sure the Father has told me to go. <laughs> but that shows you the rift. But after the resurrection, wow. the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus refuse to go without his brother. He, showed up. he appeared to him alone. And we don't know what was said there, but whatever was said there was so kind, so holy. Oh my God. <laughs> that James would become known as camel knees, as the one he got big calluses on his knees from kneeling and praying to his older brother more than anybody else. In fact, he was so undone by Jesus' love as his big brother that when he wrote his letter, he said, he didn't say, I'm the brother of Jesus. He said, I'm the slave of Jesus. I'm the bond slave of my older brother. <laughs> In fact, when you read the New Testament, who sounds, when you read a letter, which letter reads the most like the Sermon on the Mount in Jesus? James. James. Whew. Beloved, God wants to give us yeah. this great gift, and here's why. 20 years ago, the Promise Keeper movement began. How many, anybody there on the million men on the mall? Some of us. It's been a long time since then. And men are facing the greatest battles of their life, and they're facing them alone. And woe to the man who is alone, for when he falls, he will have no one to pick him up. This right now, men especially, and women, are facing the greatest battles in secret, and they're doing it alone, and we've got to turn the tide on it. That's Mike right. Bickle had a nine-day visitation That's in right. Cleveland, and in that nine-day visitation, the Lord spoke to him and said, the great revival will begin with men in community. And it will not be apostolic if it's not in community. We've got to begin to walk together to get victory. Here's why. There are some giants you can't beat alone. That's right. That's right. That's it. And there's some more giants in the land right now that are decimating Believers, and we've got to come together to give victory. Then the story. So go ahead yeah, and yeah. begin the story. And it's specifically we got, we begin, what began to happen. I think of an old message by a, one of the Pentecostal pioneers, John G. Lake, and he talks about the calling of the soul. There's an old message that he did called the calling of a soul, which means when you begin to get so desperate for God and you get hungry for him, what it begins to do is it begins to attract like-minded people to the same reality. And something began to happen in 2000 and 2001 with me and this man and with our families. And what began to happen is that the deep cry for revival, the deep cry, and that's why we're talking about you, is the cry for revival, the cry for fullness, the cry for the spirit of revelation, the cry of my heart began to find the cry of his heart. And in that furnace, the calling of the soul began to happen. And we began to place this at the center of our relationship. Now we, hear us. 
because we didn't just go, hey, you're my bud. Yeah. Actually, it's when I heard him pray. That's exactly right. In the prayer room, I heard him pray. I went, I like that fire. And I vice like versa, I'd hear him fire. pray. I'd hear him preach. I, I would listen to him and it was something would provoke me and it cut me. And when I got around somebody that cut me, I'm like, I want to be close to that guy. In fact, nothing in the natural brought us together. That's right. In fact, he's a Duke <laughs> Blue Devil fan. <laughs> My whole family's from Carolina, Tar Heel. I'm, you cut me, baby blue just <laughs> yeah. bleeds out. You cut him, dark blue devil <laughs> blue bleeds out. Wow. There is nothing for us. He's a LeBron James fan, <laughs> which I like LeBron, but I'm a Steph Curry, <laughs> Golden State fan. There's nothing in the natural to bring us together. And we both, we both came from deep sports backgrounds, him from Florida, I'm from Arkansas, and yet the first 10 years of our relationship, <laughs> it wasn't even about athletics or sports. That's something None. that began Actually, to happen no. later on in our relationship. But in 2000, things began to happen. And I want you, the greatest way that I can begin to describe what happened yep. with us, because I believe God's setting you on fire at these revival weekends. He's setting you on fire in this culture. But I believe God's now wanting to turn you to one another and say, how do we begin to host the fire? How do we begin to host it in our weeks? How do we begin to go on journeys with one another and stoke the flames? And how do we begin to see the fire grow as we see this bond serving in our youth and our young adults and our men and our women and our families? We were doing home groups together, our families doing birthdays together with our kids. But the biggest thing was we placed this bonfire in the middle of our relationship. Look with me in Luke 24, verse 13. This is what began to happen. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. Two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. These two guys are walking to Emmaus, and they're doing their best. And it says this, it says, So it was that while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. First off, I just want to say, it would be a little awkward. I'm sitting there walking with a buddy, and all of a sudden, a third guy starts walking with us. <laughs> okay, who's the third guy? I don't know. He's with us, though. I don't want to be rude and tell him to go, but... <laughs> These two guys are just talking and walking and trying to make sense of the things they've heard, which I see in this right here are brothers that are saying, we don't understand everything in this, but I'm on fire, he's on fire, and in the best weak reachings of our heart, we're going on a journey to discover who Jesus really is. Jesus began to drew, draw near them, and he went with them. It says, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him, which means he is showing up either he was showing up in a way they didn't notice and there was nothing spectacular about him, or their eyes were restrained and they couldn't see him and all of his glory, but they didn't know who he was. So Jesus asked them, and he says, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? <laughs> then the one whose name was Cleopas, everybody say Cleopas. The Lord spoke to me one day, I go, Lord, why was he sad? The Lord says, because his name was Cleopas. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he was just mad. My mama named me this. <laughs> Lord, no yeah, hopefully there are no Cleopas in here. I bless you. We love you, Cleo. We love you, Cleo. <laughs> <laughs> there was another name I did that with one time, and she was in the building, so I didn't do that no more. Anyway, it's a whole other name. <laughs> he goes, why are you sad? And this Cleopas, he was, he was feisty. 
He looked at Jesus and he said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? <laughs> he goes, dude, what rock you been living under? <laughs> he said, have you not known the things that have happened in these days? And I got to talk to Jesus about verse 19. He said, what things? I could just see the twinkle in his eye. What things? I love the playfulness of Jesus when he pulls you into the storyline and he's just baiting these guys and he goes, tell me about what things. I don't know anything. And they said the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company has arrived at the tomb early. They astonished us, and they told us they did not find his body. And it says so certain, he was just beginning to talk about the women and the report of the women saying they can't find his body. So the guys were saying, we thought Jesus was the prophet who was going to deliver Israel, do all of these things, but he died. And now all our hope is shattered. We don't know what's going on. This don't make any sense to us. And then on top of it, the girls, they can't find his body. And these guys are just sitting there, we don't get it. We don't know what's going on. <laughs> and Jesus, I love him. Then he said to them, verse 25, <laughs> the third guy's about to drop a bomb on him. <laughs> he said, he says, oh, foolish ones. <laughs> and slow of heart to believe in all. Everybody say all. all. He says, in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now get a hold of this. And beginning at Moses. So he's going to start in the Pentateuch. Those first five books of the Bible, Jesus is now going to take them on a guided Bible study through the Old Testament. And he, as, the resurrected Lord. as the resurrected Lord, and he's going to show them how Messiah must first come and suffer and then enter into his glory. And that suffering into glory is repeated all the way through the Old Testament. He begins at Moses. He goes through all. Everybody say all. all. And he expounded to them in all. Everybody say all. All the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Whew, I don't even want to go off on that. Well, they drew near to the village. Get a hold of this. Look at this in your Bible. You need to see this. They drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. I want you to understand something about the spirit of revelation. God will give you a measure and then he'll say goodbye and he'll act like he's going to continue on. And he'll say, what are you going to do with the measure of revelation you've received? And that God will say, I will give you a measure, but I'm actually looking for you to come lay hold of me because I want to do a lot more than just give you a Bible study. I want to blow your minds. Get a hold of this. He acted as if he, so he goes, see you. See you guys later. And you know what they said? Ha uh ah. -uh. Ha uh ah. -uh. But they constrained him. Everybody say constrained. constrained. That looks like this. <laughs> they constrained him. And they said, abide with us for it's towards evening. And the day is far spent. I love this. And he went in to stay with them. It kind of sounds like Revelation 3.20. I will come into him and dine with him. Now it came to pass. Everybody look at your Bible. Get this. It came to pass as he sat at the table. He took the bread, he blessed, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And right when he handed the broken bread to these disciples, the Bible says that their eyes were opened and they knew him. 
And as soon as they got revelation, oh my God, it's him. He vanished. <laughs> he, va he vanished. How many people? Now, if, if I just, me and Alan's having a dinner with a guy, we get revelation, it's him, and then he vanishes. I would look at Alan and he would look at me and we would say, did you see the guy vanish? He vanished. <laughs> He's the vanishing man. We would have written a book on the vanishing man. <laughs> Called everybody into the vanishing man anointment, <laughs> anointing. We, we'd have been doing conferences around the world. We saw the vanishing man. Here's how you can make someone vanish. This is how you'll get it. <laughs> He vanished. He's gone. I would have looked at Alan and said, did you see the guy vanish? You know what these guys did? Get this, get this. Verse 32 needs to get tattooed on fresh start spirit. Here it is. Get this. They said to one another, they both go back to what they were feeling hours earlier. And they said, did not our heart burn within us while he opened the scriptures to us? Which means more impactful than a, burning, than, a, than a vanishing man was a burning heart when he was leading the Bible study. Hear me? I'll tell you what began to happen. In December of 2000, for the last 19 years, God began to take weak and broken Allen, weak and broken Corey, who were trying our best to grow in the knowledge of Jesus, and Jesus began to walk up next to us and began to take us on a Bible study through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Psalms and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah and Malachi and Matthew and the Gospels, and it began to blow our minds around the spirit of revelation. That's right. In fact, Corey, when we came together, we heard each other, we saw each other in the prayer room, and we heard how we prayed the word. And it drew us. And in those early days, yes. it was awkward. You know how awkward it is to open a Bible with one other guy? I'm just being straight up. <laughs> Guys, don't, we could not open a Bible and like look at each other because that's, it's, it's, it's a little, I can't even do it now. I don't want to look at it. <laughs> yeah, we, we're still working that one through. <laughs> we would go to a lake so that we could walk and be like 10 foot from each other. <laughs> I'd be here, he'd be there. Reading the Bible and talking about it and then we'd <laughs> open up with each other and pray for each other. But what began to happen is the awkwardness broke off and we began to look at passages and i remember the day Corey was praying i think out of romans six and seven yes he was praying and i always knew what was burning on him because it just came out in prayer just came out like a battering ram and i would go Corey, you're holding back on me <laughs> holding back and i remember the day we went to applebee's and we sat at applebee's and the Bible's right there. He began taking me through Romans. The spirit of revelation begins to move. I don't think we ever ordered food. Uh -uh. Suddenly, we look up and our waitress is weeping profusely. <laughs> Hear me. She's weeping profusely. She looks at us weeping. She runs off. We don't ever see her again. I don't think we even ate. No, we didn't. I mean, we did. We ate just food you know not of. And then we left her a huge tip because that's what Christians do. We didn't see her again for about, I think about six weeks. I come back in Applebee's and the same lady, I didn't even recognize her. She goes, Pastor, pastor. I'm like, what? She goes, you're my pastor. She goes, you're not going to believe it. I just got out of prison. I'd lost all my children. Everything I owned was in a black trash bag. She goes, I just got that job two days out of prison. And she goes, I walked up 
She goes, I don't know what was going on. Just as y'all were talking about the word, I gave my life to the Lord. I've given my heart to him. I'm going to your church. Somebody paid for my first six months of rent. They bought me a car. She goes, you're my pastor. You know what, I looked at that beautiful woman. I go, I am your pastor. Now here's the thing. We were reading Romans. We didn't walk her through the Roman road. We didn't give her the four spiritual laws. We just burned in front of her in the presence of God. We burned. Walls began to come down in the burning. Vulnerability began to arise between us as we went on our journey. Bible verses exploding. Vulnerability and in that place of the spirit of revelation, we began to not only burn, but we began to get vulnerable about weak areas in our lives. Areas that we were wrestling with in some of the deepest places, breakthroughs in our marriages, breakthroughs in our children's lives. Breakthrough in places of the secret places in our lives and the deepest pains in our lives. Because what we begin to find is that place created a safe place for vulnerability. That's right. And then we had the tools called the Word that's to right. bear down on those problems as we shared it. So there's so few people that are filled with the Word that they go into accountability and they share, but they have nothing to combat the very thing they shared. And they imagine just because they shared it, it's going to get better. And that place of the spirit of revelation as we begin to build this friendship, when the vulnerability came, we knew how to fight it. We began to pray in the word and contend for the breakthrough that we would be better men, better husbands, better leaders, better preachers, better intercessors. And we brought the word to bear on our cold hearts. And suddenly that flame began to get brighter. And then that created the context for encounters to happen. That's right. Suddenly, where two or three or more gathered in my name, there I am. Suddenly he began to visit us around the word in a way we could have never dreamed of. We spent years 2000 to 2007 doing this, doing 30 hours a week, prayer, fasting, the word, life, being in this place together, vulnerability. In fact, that friendship, we were so committed in those early days, we looked at one another and said, you know what? We're going to commit ourselves like Simeon, that we're going to stay in the place of prayer and fasting, contending until we see the consolation of Israel, till we see the Lord return. All our days are gonna be in that chair, in that prayer room, and we committed that the first six hours of our day from 6 a.m. to noon, we were gonna be found in the place of prayer before we ever said anything publicly preaching. We were gonna go deep five days a week in the place of prayer. And every day I wanted to give up. That's right. You know how many days I did not want to do the two days a week of fasting that week. But dang it, Corey (laughs) just kept showing up and not eating. (laughs) And vice versa. And I'd be over there just getting lazy in the prayer room some seasons, wanting to check out what's going on on the phone. Alan gets up there and begins to punch those devils in the eyes and begins to declare who Jesus is. And I threw my phone away, and I'm like, I'm getting back to prayer. That's what that— Actually, how many times was a funk on us, witchcraft or whatever, and we were in that thing of— <laughs> That happens. You can preach a powerful weekend here in Peoria and go back tomorrow and all of a sudden a devil's sitting on your head and you're going, am I even called to the ministry? (laughs) They have 10 year olds that preach more powerful in Peoria than we do. And we would look at each other and and we would go, there's a funk on me. And you know what we'd say? Get up and pray. That's exactly right. Get up and pray at the microphone. And we'd get up, and when we'd pray, our own deliverance was each, each other's mouths. That's right. Woe to the man who's alone, for when he falls, he has no one to pick him up. 
But if he has a companion, when he falls, the other one will lift him up. And we begin to yes. provoke each other, yes. not because we're super strong and super spiritual, but in our weakness, we begin, when he was down, I was up. That's right. Or when we were both down, we knew the answer and just did it. And it shifted something in us. We would do like last night, we would take hours and say, we're just going to pray in tongue for an hour. We developed Until it this. broke off. We would develop this from 2000 to 2008 in a focused way. We did a 40-day fast in 2007 that began to shift things. But in 2008, we had four supernatural encounters that I believe have become life messages and that began to release that realm of encounter that we're talking about. It went from just us encountering God around the Word and to where He took us into the Word together, and it began to increase in its intensity and in its power. Do you, re do you remember... Do you remember we were sitting in the, this was what's crazy. God just began to bind our hearts together in love around the word of God in prayer in such a deep way that I, I would, we were, I think it was a Passion for Jesus conference. March of 2008. March of 2008. Were you going to say this? Yes, you, yes. You, you say it. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, if you knew our friendship, he's the date. His memory's like a steel trap. I go like, it was somewhere 2006 to nine. He's like, March 2nd, 2008. March, whatever. It's right around this season because it was GBF. And we, had, we would spend the first Monday to Wednesday of every month, they, we still do it in Kansas City, yeah. but we spend the first, and, we, and usually, back in those days, we would have our conference on the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right following after, it. following it. So it's Tuesday. And it's a three-day fast. It's a three-day fast. We're in the middle of the fast, and in the prayer room, he sits here, Mike sits there, and then I sit here. And so we're all like this, and we're facing the worship team. And it's Tuesday, I'm gonna preach the first session on Thursday, and he'll probably preach on Friday night or something. And so we're sitting in there, and we've had many prayer meetings where that were boring, and that were hard, and that we were slugging through, but this was one of those special ones that from the first string of the 10 a.m. prayer meeting, I open up my Bible, and the Holy Spirit begins to tell me Isaiah 53. And for the next two hours, I'm in an uncontrollable place of weeping uncontrollable place of encounter as Jesus began to tell me you will only grow in passion for Jesus as you understand and behold the passion of Jesus and he called me to Isaiah 53 in the suffering servant and I for two hours was writing notes weeping writing notes crying writing notes weeping writing notes gone 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 and I'm like that's the word that's what I'm preaching on Thursday God, you're speaking to me, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God. Well, noontime comes around. I literally didn't look up, and I finally look up, and we lock eyes at noon. And I look at him. <laughs> and we both say, I've got to tell you something. That's exactly. We walk right back into my office, pass Mike back to my office, and we look at each other and go, I just got visited around Isaiah 53. God told me. You cannot have passion for Jesus unless you understand the passion of Jesus. And we looked at each Pulled other's notes. notes, and it's almost the same words and phrases on the page. It was as if the Lord just walked right in the middle of us, and we're just sitting there burning around the Bible study. And it was as if the Spirit said, how many of you long to go on the road to Emmaus and have the resurrected Lord open the Scriptures? How many of you? And the Spirit said, you can. That's right. You still can by the Holy Spirit. And that day the Spirit oh. did something in us oh. and began to release those type oh. of encounters. Two month, we both preach on Isaiah 53 a couple of days later. Fast forward a couple of more months. It's in May of 2008, and me and him are going to see our good friend, Billy Humphrey, in Atlanta, Georgia, who has a, a house of prayer there. And we arrive, and we're having lunch before, 
And we're sitting around there and Billy's, me and Billy and Alan are all connecting. And Billy looks at Alan and said, Alan, you really need to meet this such and such guy. He's an anointed guy. He's got da, 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 da. He, he would, you and him would really connect. And Alan was one in, it was in one of those funky moods. And he just looked at Billy and he goes, you know what? He don't got anything. I don't got anything. We need Jesus. And I just start laughing. I just start loving it. Well, it was. Have you, <laughs> Who knows those times where you're like, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to hear me. I want Jesus. Oh, beloved. Corey said it this morning. There's enough activity around Jesus to keep you busy without you ever talking to Jesus. That's it. That's it. I'm the associate director of a missions base. That mission base at the time, we had about a thousand full-time employees, missionaries, operating about a $32 million budget. And I'm saying a thousand employees right there, another thousand students, a mega church, and to manage all that and to lead all that. And it was one of those months where it got me. And I was dry and I was tired of leading. Anybody ever been there? I was like, and then I had to do this darn conference. You know what the worst feeling is? Going to a conference drive when you know you don't have anything to say about Jesus. If you've ever done it, you don't want to ever do it again. But I was there and I was in that place and we were sitting there doing the pastor thing, saying how awesome everything is and we're the next, next guy for the thing and this and that. And he goes, you got to know this guy and they, you got the same heart. And I go, no, uh-uh. He ain't got anything going on. I don't have anything going on. I don't need him. He doesn't need me. We need Jesus. As a matter of fact, Billy, I love you. Take me back. I've got to go be with Jesus. I love you, but I don't want to talk to you. I got to be with Jesus. In fact, I'm preaching in about four hours. Leave me alone. I'm just laughing. I was ornery. They're my friends. We could be this. I was like, ornery. I go, just. Just take me back. So they start laughing, literally laughing at me. They take me back to Billy's mom's house, his big house. I go up in the upper room and I'm up there and I just lay back on the bed and I, I just felt so sorry. I remember just laying on the bed telling Jesus, I'm so sorry. I miss you. It's been a hard month. I'm so sorry. And I love Jesus because he never puts you in time out. <laughs> he never makes you the example like that. And no more had I said that than his presence just came all over me. <laughs> and Hebrews 10, 19 came in my mind having therefore boldness to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. I realized he paid it all. There was no time out. And then I had access, immediate access by the blood of Jesus. And suddenly the high priestly ministry of Jesus became so sweet to me that in my weakness I can draw near the throne of grace in time of need and find help there. And, and he came immediately to me and as he came, suddenly the presence of the Lord comes on me and I begin singing. And I go down into the bigger room where I can just walk and sing and I'm singing a song about the high priestliness of Jesus. Now, I don't have a voice, but I'm, this is a song I was singing. We place you in the highest place for you are the great high priest we place you high above all else and we come to you and worship at your feet and i just begin worshiping him that he's so kind he's such a high priest who can empathize with all of our weaknesses he's so kind he's so kind his presence is on me and I'm just worshiping. I don't know for an hour or two. I'm just, and suddenly Billy and, and, and Corey come back into the house and I can still remember. I love his childlike heart. I can still remember I hear him open the door and Corey goes, glory. 
<laughs> right when I stepped in, I hit a threshold. He goes, glory. And if you know Corey, he'll try to take over the worship set. <laughs> He starts singing, surely the presence <laughs> of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. We don't sing these songs ever. I don't ever sing that song. And as he sings that song and I'm singing the other song, for the next, I don't know, two hours, we're all singing. We're singing different songs at the same time in the same room. And Billy's over there doing something. I don't know what Billy's doing, no, no, singing no. something. <laughs> and I can't explain it, but we were in the same place of glory. I could hear him singing a different song, but it must have been in the same key as my song. And as we began to sing, the spirit of revelation began to grow in the room and suddenly, oh, oh, oh glory. Oh, oh, oh. Suddenly I heard a phrase. I heard a phrase from Revelation 21 and 22 about the new Jerusalem. I heard a phrase, there'll be no more night there. And the second phrase, for the lamb will be its light. And I just say it out loud. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm so drunk in the spirit. I don't even know where I'm at. <laughs> I say, there'll be no more night there. <laughs> For the lamb will be its light, and then suddenly, I'm gone. He's gone. Oh. The Bible said, Paul said, if I'm in my mind, it's for you. If I'm out of my mind, it's for God. And there are times That's right. when you're alone, when you're out of your mind, and it's for nobody else. It's just for God. I can't explain it. It was ecstasy. Suddenly, I, suddenly these phrases of the New Jerusalem, I just remember I was caught between the grandfather clock and the wall, stuck. And I kept saying, big gates, big gates. The wall's 1,500 miles high by 1,500 miles wide. It has 12 gates made of pearls. Beloved, what planet did God have to create that had an ocean that would have a clam that would produce a pearl that could be almost 1,500 miles high? I just kept saying, big gates. Big gates. Big gates. <laughs> and we went out of singing, and I can't explain it. Maybe you have language for Corey because we were in a different realm where we were proclaiming scriptures yep. related we got into to this the new place Jerusalem. Around the new Jerusalem, a phrase is speaking. He was in the apex, the vortex of the encounter, and it's almost like I was a scribe that was there, and I was seeing and feeling and hearing, and verses were exploding, but it all shifted, and he, he went over in the corner, and he got on the ground. Oh. And suddenly, oh. I can't explain it, but travail hit me, and I went from ecstasy to travail, and as I'm travailing, the only way I can describe it is a trance because I can still hear Billy, I can still hear Corey. But suddenly my spirit lifted. Oh! And I was 
outside the, new, the gates of the New Jerusalem. That's the only way I can describe it. I knew I was still in the room, but I was there. <laughs> and I heard the Lord's voice. I'll never forget it. He said, my people know hardly anything about this place. <laughs> and then I'll never forget it. He's so much more kind than me. He goes, I'll never forget it. He said it was such confidence and joy. He goes, but they will. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isaiah 42 says he never grows discouraged. That's right. And then he began to talk to me. He said, my people think this place is symbolic. And they've been living in the second heavens, doing spiritual warfare, trying to pick up, pick up puzzle pieces for a little bit of breakthrough. And he said, they need to get up higher. <sighs> Where light shines in the darkness and the darkness can overcome it. He said, you're seated in heavenly places. Get up higher. <sighs> and suddenly I can't explain it. But I knew there was a place where healing and deliverance and salvation was effortless as the light shines into the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. And as he said it, suddenly I come back into my body and I don't know what happens after that. I won't know for weeks. I'll take over. <laughs> he is absolutely gone is what he is. And it's at that time that we had to get to the service. He's preaching that night. We have to get him to the service. So me and Billy literally pick him up, carry him, put him in the back seat, drive to the event, get into the, uh, the office, which is right connected to the, to the building. And we are absolutely gone. He is gone. We're in this place of revelation. I can just feel... No, beloved, I'm a, I, at this point, I'm a Bible school president. I, I'm not just some flaky guy over here. I, 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 I try to discern things and teach things and, you know, everything in its proper order. <laughs> and yet angels are moving me. And they, would, they kept trying to put me yeah, on the yeah. pulpit. Angels kept yeah. moving me to the back corner. Yeah, this is what we, we put him up I there. I kept saying, let no flesh glory in his presence. But he was right here. They'd be moved around, and there's the people facing this way, and he'd just be with his hands up in the corner. No flesh shall glory in his presence. No flesh shall glory in his presence. I'm talking about he's in the corner, and he's gone. And for one moment, he came to, in the, I mean, I'm talking about like 30 minutes off in the corner. And he's just worshiping with no flesh or glory in his presence. And then you come to and you see that guy in the back. I look in the back and the Lord says, watch this. How effortless healing is. I see a young black man. And the Lord says, he's been dealing with insanity. I'm delivering him right now. I said, young man, the Lord is delivering you of mental illness right now. And it was like, I can't explain it, a hundred pound brick hit him in the head, drove him to the floor. He shook for a couple hours and Shut got up, up in his right mind. Here's the deal. This young man, this young man, two days before in their homeless outreach, they had seen him cold in a park and they brought him into the house of prayer. 24 seven house of prayer in Atlanta. But he was mentally ill, but guess what? He used to be a piano player. And the Lord healed him just like that. Boom, healed him, put him in his right mind so he could worship in the house of the Lord. And I look over and the Lord says, I'm delivering him. And just with a word, power was released and people were screaming and deliverance and healing was taking place. And then it was just like a five minute window and then no flesh or glory in his presence. <laughs> the problem was I had to do my nephew's wedding the next morning. I had to fly to St. Simon's Island in Georgia. 
but I don't know where I'm at. They put me on the plane, literally. I'm on the front row of the small little jet. <laughs> no flesh of glory in his presence. <laughs> I get off and I'm late. The plane was late, so I'm late and I get right, I step right up next to my father-in-law who's facilitating the wedding with me and I can't open my eyes and I go, Dad, just tell me when to go. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the only way I can explain it is I felt above the crowd. And the Lord said, I'm going to restore marriages in this wedding service. And the Lord released a word that I probably had three or four couples come up to me afterwards and say, we were on the verge of divorce and we can't explain it. But something changed. <clears throat> We're staying together. Then my brother-in-law tries to take me back to the airport because I have to fly back and finish the conference. And as we're going through the Burger King drive-through, the Lord speaks about the lady in the drive-through. The power of God hits her. And all of a sudden, she gives her life to the Lord. And I drive off in the cars. We're just worshiping. And she's in crumbled tears about Jesus. He was in the intensity of that for about two weeks. That hit us in May, and it opened up a door. And I believe these were life messages that God was marking us with around the New Jerusalem. Because that became a life pursuit to yes. study yes. that place. That's right. To get an understanding of who we are and what our citizenship is a part of. In September, probably about four months later, I'm not going to go into this one as much just for time's sake. I'll spend our, the last part on our, the, the last one, but he was in Hong Kong, and I'm in Kansas City, and around the same time, we both get a holy download out of Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Literally, same time. No, the same this. time. Because you're 12 hours difference. God wakes me up in the middle of the night just to put me on his time clock, and we're yeah. having the same encounter. Spirit of Elijah. Time. The spirit and the power of Elijah turning the hearts of fathers to children and the hearts of children to the fathers. And God began to call me to that Nazarite vow and lifestyle. And I knew God was calling me to that consecration at a whole nother level. Speaking the spirit of Elijah to him, God marked us. And that's become a life message that's still living in us today. But the last one that I want to share of 2008 was a couple of months later in November of 2008. We're flying to Curitiba, Brazil. We're going to do a call event with Stacy Campbell, who uh, Lou Engel does the American one. She was leading the ones in Brazil, and she had me and Alan come in. And as we were on that flight and as we were descending in, God just began to now and this time open us up to Revelation 1. And we began to open up the Bible to Revelation 1, and before we knew it, we could feel the embers and the invitation, like Jesus is saying, do you want it? Do you want it? And we stepped through this, and all I can say is that we went to the hotel room, and over the next 24 to 48 hours, we didn't sleep much. The only times we left the hotel room was to go and to speak at the event and immediately run back. But for around 48 hours, we had Revelation 1 open, down on our knees, and we would just whisper phrases of Revelation 1 and waves of the spirit of revelation, of encounter, of visitation would rush over the room and we would weep uncontrollably for hours as phrases would come out of us around Revelation 1. That was what marked us the whole time. We go to bed that last night, we're reading in there about Jesus having the key of David. We're reading in there about the man and about his beauty and his eyes of fire and how he's in the midst of the lampstands. And then that night we go to bed. The, the last night we're going to leave the next morning. And Alan has a powerful dream. I want you to share this dream. And in the dream, I'm, we're battling the strong man of Brazil. And we're not doing so hard. But at the last moment, we cast him off. Might comes on us. We cast him off and we see a light shining up from the nation of Brazil going out like a covering 
over the nation and we run to that house and we know it's the house of prayer. Night and day worship and prayer is ascending like a light to the heavens. And as we come up to the door, I look and my niece who's Laura Hackett or now she's Laura Hackett Park, the famous worship leader. She's there leading worship and her little sister is behind her and the power of two sisters coming together is releasing light all over Brazil. So I come into the house and I know it's the house of prayer when suddenly there's a knock on the door and I walk up to the door and it's a little like 12, just a little young Brazilian boy. And I open the door and he says, I've come for the kid, David. And I look at this little boy, I go, you've come to the right place. And I wake up and suddenly there's a knock on the door. We didn't, I, beloved, here's, here's why I want to say this, one quick thing, which is this was our first time being introduced to Brazil on, an, on a national platform of Lou Engle. We had, we, the, the normal thing to do would to be you know, God used me mightily to open many, many doors through Brazil and then network with all the high profile apostolic leaders on the, on the stage and exchange cards and keep doing. We didn't even know the conference was going on. They had to knock on our hotel door and go, hey, you're going to be speaking in 30 minutes. Okay. I spoke on nine day prayer. He spoke on the spirit of prayer. And then we went, take us back to the hotel. <laughs> And we just fed on that. Well, we got the knock the next morning. We said, you're late to the airport. So we throw on our clothes. And as I go to put on my shoes, I go to, I just told him the dream. I go to put on my shoe and I go, what in the world? I take off my shoe in front of him. I go, what? And there, I take it out. There's an ancient key in my shoe. You go, how do you know it's an ancient key? I don't, it just looked like an ancient key, people. <laughs> I didn't do carbon dating or anything. <laughs> it was old, okay, old. <laughs> and suddenly the Lord, the presence of the Lord moved upon us and validated you don't realize how important your labors are in lands and cities and places. And we just looked at each other. Beloved, here, here's the poor. The key wasn't the important part. You know, I don't even have the key. I lost the darn key. I saw it. Corey was like, Corey was like, you lost the key. <laughs> I go, and then we got, the key wasn't the important part. You know what it was? Revelation 1 was the That's important right. part. That's right. The Word. And the Word and kept till We don't even have time, but we began to have these precursory encounters that would kick off an awakening in our midst that would lead to 1,500 baptisms, 7,000 documented healings, and a nine-month period. Never seen anything like it. I remember the night... What I experienced in that New Jerusalem hit that room. And I remember the night when a man, funny enough, his name was Charlie Brown. A man named Charlie Brown who had been in our church for, he had been deaf all these years after 35 years of deafness in the worship. Hallelujah. His ear popped open. Pop. He began to scream. Ah! He came up and we got God's healing ears. If you have a deaf ear, come up. And I remember 12 people stood across. And from the left to the right, I watched as pop, ah, pop, ah, pop, 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 pop. Skip one guy, pop, 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 pop. I don't know why I skipped a guy. I'm not going to make up theology, but it skipped the guy. But I watched 11 ears open right in front of me. I watched full body makeovers. I watched God do things for that nine months I'd never seen. 
I watched the casino driver driving home, and as he's driving home, he sees an IHOP shuttle, and the Spirit speaks to it and says, this is your last chance to repent. You need to follow that shuttle. He follows it, comes in. Guy, a student, gives him a word of knowledge. He humbles himself, gets, gets saved, and then gets baptized in the Holy Spirit and comes up. And he begins to testify. I remember the night when another young man got a call. He called his cousin who lives in Kansas City. He's from Illinois, this guy. And he goes, I'm going to kill myself because I, my, I had a motorcycle accident. I'm half paralyzed. I'm addicted to all kinds of drugs. I, I'm on this, this, and this. And my fiance, who was pregnant with my child, aborted my child and ran off with another man. And his cousin said, get here. God's here. Just get to Kansas City. I don't care how you do it. Just get here. God's here. The man walked in the room and a student. This is why when I saw these on fire young people, they weren't waiting for the message of the platform. That a young on fire student came and gave him a word of knowledge about his illness, about his paralyzation because of an accident. And he spoke to him, prayed for him. He got fully healed on the spot, gave his life to Jesus. He came up. And he began to testify. He said, nobody told me Jesus was like this. It was raw. I mean, he gave the gospel. It was interlaced with cuss words because he wasn't sanctified yet. It was awesome. (laughs) Nobody told me Jesus was blankety blank this good. (laughs) And you know what he did? He said the gospel totally unchurched. He gave the gospel and he said, if you want to be healed and baptized with the Spirit, come up here on these lines right now. He didn't know what lines are. (laughs) The lines for altar ministry. He goes, come up here and stand on these lines. I watched it night after night after night after night after night as the Spirit of God began to move, and I would look over at Corey and go, Right now our men are being decimated, but you were made to be carriers of revival. You were made to come together with another man around the Word of God. If you knew, if we had the time to tell you our second half about when it all goes bad and when brothers are born for adversity, you'd realize we're the weakest of all men. If God can do it with us, He can do it with anyone. Revival. Capital R, big global revival is going to come when men come together in community. We're going to push back this giant in the land called pornography. We're going to take our stand. We're going to take our stand. Ladies, we're going to take our stand. We're going to begin to get in relationship. Do you know this man? I'll just tell you this one thing. I'm sitting, I had made a vow, I would never look at anything. And the Lord had kept me so pure, my boy sold pornography way before I ever did. Pure eyes. I'm sitting on a couch. All my computers were accountable. It's got Net Nanny on it. You ever had Net Nanny on a computer? Net Nanny is locked down. You can't even look up the Virgin Islands without the thing <laughs> shutting down for t- 24 hours. Virgin Islands, shut down. (laughs) Net nanny. As a leadership team, we have to do everything to be accountable. But my wife, uh, 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 what was it? Frosty the snowman soap dish broke. And her mom, her blessed mom, who's gone to be with the Lord, gave her that soap dish. So she wanted that soap dish. So I'm like, just do a Google search for Frosty the Snowman soap dish. Seems pretty safe, doesn't it? It's got net nanny. Frosty the Snowman soap dish. It's not even a word you can reconfigure to be a dirty word. 
and on my screen pops a picture. And that picture, I'd never seen anything like that. And suddenly the battle, which used to be on the outside of the house, got on the inside of the house. But I had a brother. I had a brother who I'd go to, and you know what I did? Ask him. I traded in my smartphone for a dumb phone. For like three years, I'm walking around with those big carry cases with a phone that's like. <laughs> Why? Wasn't safe for me. A brother who's accountable. And we begin to go through a battle. If we had time, we could tell you how for the next years we begin to battle for our sanctification of our souls. But I had a brother when I fell down. I had a brother who could pick me up, still pick me up. He'll still ask me to get in my grill. How's your eye gate? He does it to me. I just tell you, though, I'm wrecked, though, this weekend. Anyway, I just, I'm just so grateful for a friend. <sighs> and I know men are alone today. We need to come together. One last thing, and this is truly the last thing. <laughs> no, the last thing for preachers, like, notice that it's 30 more minutes. <laughs> but, but this truly is. If you were to ask pastors in Africa in the Nigeria-Kenya line, when Islam began to come down, that first wave of pastors didn't know how to combat it. They were taken back how all the money that rushed in from Saudi Arabia and these oil countries to push Islam down through Africa. And as it began to come, that first generation didn't find their bearings. But you know what? The second generation, they weren't too good at evangelizing, but they just decided to take their stand. I'm not yielding ground, even if you kill me. I'm not yielding ground. But then they had sons. And now that third generation of Kenyan, Nigerian, Ugandan pastors, they're terrifying. They know how to wield the word. They know the Koran as good as a Muslim does. And they walk into villages and they preach the gospel unafraid of losing their lives. And now the gospel is beginning to push up. Oh. Here's what I'm saying. You're facing a giant. And that first wave, it swept in and began to decimate the men of our generation. But I've got news for you. Yes. There's men who are standing now. Yes. You can't have my eyes. You can't have my brothers. You can't have my sons. You can't have my generation. And they're beginning to find one another. And we were born for adversity. Men, you can't fight some giants alone. You need a brother. A brother who's there. A brother you can get honest and pray with and contend with. But you don't even have a chance unless you have the spirit of burning revelation on the inside. And you don't get that thing alone. That's right. He comes up behind two men walking together. He doesn't just come talk to Cleopas. He's got to have two of them. Thus the revelation. And I believe right now, there's about to be a new promise keepers movement break oh, over in come America. On, come on, declare it. There's about come to be a new side. awakening of men to yes. come together like never before who are going to take their stand and our sons yeah. are going to grow up yeah. knowing how to deal with this behemoth, this Goliath. I want the men to come up here right now. Yeah. Yeah. Fire. Fire. Oh! Fire. 
Fire. Fire. Because I can tell you this. Fire. I know literally tens of thousands of men who have just answered an altar call repenting, but didn't get with another man in a bond of love, and they didn't have the power to overcome it. But you got to get with another man. You got to get together. You got to get in a covenant together. We're going to be faithful to our wives. We're going to be faithful to our pastors. We're going to be faithful to one another. We're going to take our stand. We're going to get vulnerable. We're going to get real. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get free and stay free. We're going to overcome this thing. What would happen? If a whole church of men said, we're going to take a 40-day fast and we're going to break the power of this thing. And then after the 40-day fast, we're going to walk weekly with one another. We're going to get in each other's lives. We're going to ask God to give us a partner to contend with. Youth coming together for purity, wearing their purity rings or whatever you do, making a statement, I'm taking my stand. And the evil one can't have my eyes. He can't have my heart. He can't have my, my, my wife, my marriage. He can't have it. It's mine. Jesus, lift your hands. Now, ladies, me. you got the same issues. I know it. I talk to women. It's switching. Pornography, six, 40 to 60% of women nowadays. It's your battle too. It's our battle. That's right. We've got to do this. I was so blessed that your women meet. Your men need to come together. This needs to be one of your highest priorities. Well, I don't have time. Oh, beloved, if you don't kill Goliath, you're going to lose your whole nation. You don't have time to do anything else but to slay this beast. Ha. To shoot this devil right in the head. Ah. To come together. Ha. Now women, lift your hands towards the men. Ha. Go ahead and ha. lead us, Corey. Come on, lift up your voices all over the place. This is Jacob. Clean hands. Pure hearts. No idols. Spirit of burning. Spirit of revelation. Spirit of prayer. Come on, lift your voices. Release the fire of the Holy Spirit right now. Release the fire of the Holy Spirit. Fire in your eyes. Fire on your hands. Fire on your spirit. Fire on your mind. Fire on your emotions. Fire in the name of Jesus. Put your hands over your eyes right now. Say, Jesus, cleanse my eyes from all defilement, perversion, immorality. I break agreement. Jesus, have mercy. Forgive me of my sins. In the name of Jesus, I receive your blood. Your cleansing. Wash me now. I want my thoughts to be clean. My emotions to be clean. My desires to be clean. Wash me now, Jesus. Say, in the name of Jesus. Come on, come on. In the name of Jesus. I receive your cleansing. And in the name of Jesus, I shut every door to darkness. I break agreement with darkness. Sexual perversion. I break agreement with you. And in the name of Jesus, I open up new doors. Doors of light. Doors of truth. Doors of revelation. In the name of Jesus. Satan. Satan. I command you. 
Leave my mind. Leave my emotions. Leave my desires. You are not my master. And I'm not your servant. Jesus is my master. So I command you. Go. 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 Now lift your hands all over the place. Ladies in the back. Lift your hands. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of revelation, the spirit of burning, the spirit of fire, the spirit of glory, the spirit of beauty. I receive the spirit of revelation. Receive right now all over this room. Ladies, receive this spirit of revelation. Break agreement with the fantasies. The fantasies, we command your power to be broken. I declare a revival in the Bible. Yes! A revival in the Bible! Yes! Oh, word of God explode. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. I've hidden. I've hidden your word in my heart that I would not sin that I would not sin against you. Now hear him, hear me. This isn't about preachers getting this together. It's just about two men getting together. We're as dull as anybody else when it comes to the word, unless we put our cold hearts in front of that warm fire of his word and he comes. You might find another businessman, a teacher, a nurse, a student. Well, whoever it is, begin to ask God, give me a brother. Give me a brother. It may be two to five of you together. You may start a small group together. That God will begin to bring you together. Begin to ask God for a brother born for adversity. A brother born for adversity. Someone you can contend with in the game. So, Father, we ask for that anointing for spiritual friendship. That fellowship of the burning heart to rest on this house in the name of Jesus. Just wait before him right now. We're going to wait before him. Put your eyes on God. Oh, increase your fire right now, Holy Spirit. I declare that the word of God will be a consuming fire in your spirit. Yes. Release that realm of encounter around the word of God. Fire. Fire on my altar, never burn. May the fire on my altar never burn. Make me a house of forever. Fire on my altar, never burn. Fire on my altar, never burn. May the fire on my altar never burn. Make me a house of forever. Fire on my altar, never burn. Fire. Fire strategies, businessmen strategies. Come on, lift your hands, lift your hands. Fire on my altar, never burn. 
never burn. May the fire of my heart never burn. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire of my heart never burn. May the fire of my heart never burn. May the fire of my heart never burn. Make me a house of prayer. We say, Lord, make me.
we're just going to do one symbolic act. It's just something about we're, we're physical creatures. And when we make that physical step, there's something that it just sets us. That's why the Lord gave us communion. There's that something of that physical nature. I want us all the men to just stand up and just link arms around one another right now. Put your arms around each other or link arms, whatever's most comfortable. Don't hold hands. That just gets too awkward for men. That's weird. That's weird. It's all sweaty and nasty. Now, ladies, I want you to do the same. It's time to come together. Revival will begin with men in community. It's not apostolic if it's not men in community. It's time. It's time for fresh start to have a men movement. Oh, your womb, give birth to something. Give birth to something that could go around the nation. God, release fire on the altar of every heart. Release fire on the altar of every marriage, every home, every church, every ministry, every family in the name of Jesus. Now we're going to sing this song, and I want you to sing it together. You're going to be your brother's keeper. Make me a house of bread, a house of bread. Lord, make me a house, make me a house of bread, a house of bread. Lord, make me a house, make me a house of bread. Lift your eyes to heaven and say this to the Lord. Make this your prayer tonight. down and just as a declaration man all the way down it's Sam right is it Samuel I want you to lead us I want you to come up here front and center and I want as a declaration as men of God a cappella, uh, we're gonna sing the same thing but it's a declaration and women I want you to hear us we're for real we're taking our stand We're going to be men, faithful men, faithful to our wives, raise godly children, and the next generation's going to push back that spirit of perversion. I want you to lead us just with our voices. This is a house of voices. 
Lead us in it right now. Lead the army. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. A corporate David is about to slay a giant. Never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Hey! Make me a house of prayer. Oh, may the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Oh, lift it up. May the fire on my altar never lift burn out. Lift it up. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire. Never burn out. Make me a house. Oh, we say, Lord, Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. A house of prayer. Come on, lift it up. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. A house of prayer. Just feel like the prophet Samuel just anointed a corporate David. But we're not done yet, men. Stay linked. We're not. These are just small prophetic acts, but they mean something in the spirit. Jessica, I want you to lead the ladies. And men, I want us to close our eyes and link arms, and I want us to hear. There's a pure hearing of one another tonight.
Sing it, ladies. Lift your voices. Powerful. Powerful. Mighty. Now let's do it together. Lead us. Oh, Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of bread. A house of bread. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of bread. In the spirit the oh god make me a house of prayer may the fire on my altar never burn out may the fire on my altar never burn out may the fire on my altar never burn out make me a house of prayer may the fire on my altar never burn out may the fire on my altar never burn out may the fire on my altar Never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire on my altar never burn out. May the fire. Fire on my altar, never burn up. Make me a house of prayer. 
Do you hear that? Do you hear that? These young ones, these third generation, <laughs> they won't stop. <laughs> We're ready to go home. These boys said, keep going. Purity. I'd like to do one more thing that Corey that may have been one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard in my life it's the most beautiful thing I've ever I just but I want to I wonder if you'd let me ask you to lead one more song just I love you Lord and I lift my voice I love you Lord I just want to sing right to Jesus. He's doing something so special in us tonight. I just want to sing this to him before we go. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul. hear this song in my head and oh how he loves you and me oh how he loves you and me he gave his life what more could he give oh how he loves you oh how he loves me, oh, how he loves you and me. Sing it one more time. Oh, how he loves you and me, oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life 
What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Wow. Wow, wow. I want to thank Alan and Corey for being so transparent with all of that. That was one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. Really. Wow. I'm just, uh, as always, when we get to this time, I'm just so full, so full, and how God is so faithful, and God has been sp speaking strategically to us all weekend. What, what we received, I just felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, I said, you know what you're receiving this weekend is prophetic instruction. Prophetic instruction. It's just one thing to hear a good message, powerful messages, we need those. We need good teachings, we need those. But instruction is like, it gives you what you need to know what to do. We have received powerful instruction. And uh, I just thank you guys. I, I, I'm sure it was a little difficult to come to a, an agreement of what you should do that tonight, being the atmosphere that we've been in all weekend. But I'm telling you, that was right on. And I thank you so much for being obedient to the Holy Spirit for that. And I, I thank God for every one of you men of God today. I thank you so much. I love each one of you so much. And absolutely, absolutely, God is going to do a, a, a powerful work in all of our lives. We're going to be a prototype. You're going to be men, a prototype man. You're going to be a new breed of men God's raising up in the body of Christ. We are going to be a new kind of man. Yes. And because of that, God is going to use each one of you. Your hands are going to be clean, and they're going to be powerful, and you're going to lay hands on other men, and they're going to receive miracles and signs and wonders. You guys are going to be amazing what God is doing in your life. And uh, the, the, when they were really just getting into this, I was sitting there, and I was just going, Lord, what, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> what do we do with this? And... Uh, I know we have our man up, and it's powerful, and it's, and it's awesome, and I love every, every time we get together, man up, but I'm telling you, there's something deeper God got for us, and uh, so, I, so well, let's pray together, and let's believe God will give us uh, some strategies, whatever we need, amen, to really make this work, not just another thing to do for men, but something that really is, 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 is authentic and, and organic, and that will cause us to rise up and be the men of God He's called us to be, yes, and I know God's got something for us, and so we'll believe together, pray together. And see what God is going to do in that as he's raising up an amazing uh, uh, group of revivalists in this place. And so obviously the women of God, we love you. And I know God's going to do powerful things through the ladies. He always does. Thank you, ladies, for praying for us tonight. There ain't nothing like having a, a wife pray over you. Amen. And so this weekend has just been, it's just been, for me, it's been just, just refreshing. It's been deep. And uh, I thank God for everything that has taken place. All of you that have served all weekend long, the servant leaders that have served, thank you so much. Those in the parking lot, those in the foyer, those on the altar. All of those that's been serving with our children all weekend and over there serving right now, we bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. While they're having revival over there, where they're raising up a generation over there, a revivalist, signs and wonders and miracle, world changers. Yes. Yes. And so it's been, it's been, it's been a blessed, blessed, blessed weekend. Yes. 
Thank you for watching Fresh Start Church's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this message, take a minute and click the subscribe button so you won't miss any of our videos. If you've been impacted by Fresh Start Church and want to partner with us to continue to reach others, you can text OFFERING to 623-299-2707 to give right now. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.